Welcome to episode 44. It's an exciting week. Christmas is coming, the holidays, etc. This is ForensicWeek.com. I'm your host, Tom Moriello, coming to you from Laurel, Maryland, CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Tonight, forensic DNA analysis. We have with us two preeminent forensic molecular molecular biologist Dr. William Watson joining Dr. Daniele Podini to discuss forensic DNA and Dr. Podini's research on predicting biogeographic traits, which is going to be really interesting to hear about. ForensicWeek.com is a talk show, ladies and gentlemen, that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists and investigators, real law enforcement officers, and real counterintelligence experts who find, collect, and examine forensic evidence in the performance of their duties. Broadcast live right here on your desktop every Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on www.forensicweek.com. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows like this one, recorded and broadcast live using Google+, Plus, a social networking service. Forensic IQ update report, researched and presented live by my student interns from the University of Maryland, keep you up on current issues events and training opportunities that are important in the forensic community. Student producers and interns with us this evening are from the George Washington University, Lara Pachuki, our producer. Stevenson University's Derek Wong, co-producer. University of Maryland criminal justice student intern Alex Mitzel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, on December 17th this week, 2013, uh, I got to tell you, I had the honor of being named one of the top 15 CSI professors in the United States. Now, I wasn't sure what that was because I get this email from uh, the editor of ForensicsColleges.com. I said, well, that's very nice. What does that mean? So very quickly, I learned that ForensicsColleges.com is a website that highlights forensic colleges and universities. It's a website that students like you who are listening can go to to learn about the forensic uh, community, um, the, uh, the disciplines, to understand what universities teach forensics uh, and what subjects are being taught, where they're located around the country, the categories of, of career fields and disciplines that are there. So um, I was certainly uh, very honored and humbled to be one of the 15 across the country that were identified. Uh, I would strongly suggest to you to go to ForensicsCollege.com for those of you who are interested in learning more about the forensic uh, uh, disciplines in the forensic community. Before I introduce our guests and begin this evening's discussion, let's hear from our producer, Laura Pachuki, to tell you how to ask questions, make comments, uh, and get and communicate with us uh, during the show and after. Laura? All right. Thank you, Tom. Hey everyone, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future shows, you can send an email to ForensicWeek at gmail.com. You can view all of our online shows 24-7 at our website, ForensicWeek.com. If you're watching live and you have a question for any of our guests, you can post it on YouTube, and I'll bring it up right here for us to ask live on the show. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you like tonight's show. And you can always search for us on Facebook at theforensicweek.com show. Thanks. Back to you, Tom. Okay, thank you. Let's introduce our guest, Dr. Padini, born and raised in the beautiful country of Italy where my ancestors all come from. Dr. Padini is uh, now an assistant professor of forensic molecular biology in biological sciences at the George Washington University. Prior to coming to the United States, he served as second in command of the biology section of the scientific department of the Italian military armed forces. In the private sector, he directed the forensic section, as well as being responsible for molecular diagnostic section, a private molecular, molecular biology laboratory in Rome. Dr. Bedini's current research is to make DNA analysis divulge more than po just positive identification, but to include key information about people's hair, eye, and skin color in their ancestry. If successful, it could enable crime investigators to develop a physical description of a suspect based on skin evidence such as few skin cells or, or a biological fluid left at a crime scene. 
It would also help identify human re remains, uh, especially in mass cavities. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Bedini to ForensicWeek.com. Dr. Bedini, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, thank you. I, I thank use you. technology like this, so it's great to be here. Great, thank you so much. And I know, I know, uh, both of us being professors, it's it's the uh, near the end of of exams in uh, the semester, so it's, I know it's a busy time. So thank you. Our second guest, Dr. William Watson, began his career as a forensic DNA technologist at the Southwest Institute of Forensic Science at the Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office. He worked as a forensic scientist with the Fort Worth Police Department Criminalistic Laboratory, where he developed and implemented DNA profiling procedures. Later, he accepted a position with uh, Orchid Cellmox Incorporated in Dallas, Texas, where he eventually became forensic laboratory director and technical leader in their Nashville, Tennessee laboratory. While at Orchid, he participated in the validation of new procedures and equipment, performed DNA analysis, and provided courtroom testimony. Since leaving Orchid, Dr. Watson has lectured nationally and internationally on forensic science, interpretation of mixed DNA profiles, which is something I want to talk to him about, the application of forensic statistics, and the use of DNA databases in DNA analysis in mass casualties. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Watson, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the invitation. Looking forward to it. Okay. Now, I don't know where to start, so I'm going to start with Dr. Padini because he, he's the, uh, the first person we made contact with, uh, and, I, and I thank our producer for that. Dr. Padini, okay, um, tell us where DNA has, has been uh, and, where, and, and where we are today in reference to your research uh, and uh, how it's, it's being used um, in, in the crime scene and in the courtrooms. Well, uh, I think that uh, uh, by now it's, it's common knowledge that uh, DNA can, can be used uh, soundly to identify an individual. So, in other words, if we, we obtain a, a DNA from biological evidence at a crime scene and, and the conventional DNA profile matches a uh, suspect or, or a profile in the database, we can we can conclude that it's it's the same source or an identical twin of the of the individual. Uh, but uh, the conventional DNA profile doesn't really tell us anything about the individual, so it's really worthless unless there's a there's a comparison, there's something to compare it to. So uh, this is where my research comes in, and I'm obviously not the only one that's that's working on this. There there are a lot of fellow scientists in, in the community in the United States and, and abroad that are working on this. Is to be able to use uh, uh, the information that can be obtained uh, from from DNA to uh, make predictions on other characteristics of the individuals, like the ancestry of the individual or uh, physical traits like uh, eye color, hair colors skin pigmentation and uh, this can can help the it, it can be another piece of the puzzle of the that, that the investigation is so being able to um, um, reduce the number of suspects or uh, maybe corroborate the testimony of a witness uh, might be very useful to the investigation it might help uh, reduce the you know optimize the resources, maybe assist in, in interrogating a suspect. And so this is, uh, this is what I've been working on. Great. Let me ask Dr. Watson, uh, based on um, what Dr. Patini just said, um, do you think that the general public will be concerned about that? I think that's valuable, and I think that would be unbelievable in our investigations. Uh, but since DNA has been uh, identified back with um, started in 1984, 1985, the general public has been concerned about DNA and the privacy and what we can get from it. Um, do you think um, that the, uh, the criminal justice system might have a problem with going that far? Uh, they, they're, they've accepted that DNA is a positive identification and the Supreme Court just said it's just like fingerprints. but. If we can go further and get the some of the information that Dr. Padini mentioned, uh, what what's your take on that? Well, Tom, uh, it's a good question. I think there are a couple of issues that come up. Uh, first of all, that sort of testing, testing to look for 
uh, geographical um, associated traits uh, has has already been applied in, in at least one forensic case that I can think of out of Louisiana where um, a gentleman uh, a, a suspect a perpetrator uh, committed a, a series of uh, I believe they're sexual assault homicides and uh, those samples were sent to a laboratory that now is no longer uh, uh, in business and they were able to determine um, a, a racial background or a potential racial background for the suspect and um, in fact it did not match the, 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 the profile that they generated didn't match uh, what was expected or what uh, other, other witnesses had put forward and in fact it turned out they were correct when the defendant or the suspect was captured it turned out that their description of him as being a, uh, a mixed uh, uh, African-American Caucasian was in fact correct. Um, so it, it's already here uh, in some limited applications. I think uh, uh, that what, what uh, Daniele is, is working on in his laboratory is, is that obvious next step uh, looking at even more characteristics. And yes, I think it, it does concern some people uh, related to privacy, uh, as it always has when it comes to DNA testing, but uh, it, I think it's really more of a, uh, we're not getting the information out to the public in a way that helps them understand what it is that we're looking at and why. Um, uh, generally, uh, we don't look at any genetic traits related to diseases. Uh, those are things that would, people would consider to be very private. Um, looking at a, a potential um, um, geographical information about where a person might be from and putting that forward, uh, I don't think I don't think too many people would argue that that is a, an invasion of privacy. Some would, because some always do, but I think in general the public would agree that, that that's not a, a major invasion. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, if I could ask Dr. Padini, so but Dr. Padini, uh, you, uh, what you're looking at, and, and, and Dr. Watson just mentioned, you know, uh, diseases, etc. Again, uh, any illnesses an individual has is, you know, is normally protected, etc., etc. So how do you separate what you're doing your research in those characteristics from other things? How, how would that be done, or how could that be done? Well, uh, we we are focusing on genes that can. If we let's talk about uh, physical traits now, like uh, pigmentation. So we are focusing on genes that um, uh, can provide us information on on the pigmentation of the individuals, and the regions that we're looking at are not associated, to the best of our knowledge, to a specific disease although some of these genes have been identified as playing a role in pigmentation because they were associated to diseases in particular uh, albinism you know the, the the lack of pigmentation so these genes were discovered with mutations and so it was able we were able to, the scientific community was able to determine that uh, they are associated to pigmentation because of that now um, we are trying, obviously, to stay away uh, from disease-predicting uh, regions uh, as much as possible because uh, we know that that is a concern, but surely we can't exclude that some of these might be uh, in the future. You know, I'm listening to you, and I'm, 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 I'm reflecting on uh, Sunday 60 Minutes uh, when they were talking to uh, the general, the director of NSA, about what part of the telephone logs NSA is looking at versus uh, what is needed. And so I think what you're saying is, okay, there are certain things that um, we're looking at, and that's the only thing we're concerned with, and we're going to ignore the other things. Is, is that basically, again, this is not my area of expertise, you can probably tell. So uh, in yes, plain sir. English, is but that what you're saying? Yes, but we're doing that already. So uh, the conventional DNA profile, we extract the entire DNA from the evidence at a crime scene, and then we kind of zoom in on the regions that are necessary 
uh, to identify an individual. And the same thing is here. We're focusing only on the regions that can help us make predictions on uh, certain characteristics of the individual. And we're trying to, f we're focusing on things that are already observable uh, with the naked eye on the individual. So we're trying to look at eye color, which is already a, a visible trait. We're looking at biogeographic ancestry, which is already a physical trait. And um, one of the advantages of, of, a, of a scientific approach in making this prediction is that it's not biased. So uh, a, a witness of a crime might, uh, you know, might be affected by his or her previous experiences. If if they've been robbed by a person for for a certain from a certain population, and they witness another crime, they might associate the two and uh, make a mistake in, in attributing the individual of the crime that they witnessed to, to the proper population. Um, so. Mm, Another thing that I that I think it's important to specify is that this information would not replace the conventional DNA profile. This would be something to use during the investigation. Once a suspect is identified, then the conventional DNA profile would be would be used to uh, associate that individual to the crime. So, so if you have, uh, who's that? Oh, here. Tom. Yeah, go ahead, Derek. Yeah, um, so your method of uh, identifying, uh, like, uh, bi biogeographic traits, um, is that any different than what's, or you said, okay, what is currently being used uh, in the forensic science community to um, analyze DNA? Can you explain that to the audience and tell us how what you're doing is different from uh, what's currently being done? So the, the current method is based uh, on looking at patterns of uh, specific locations that are spread out through the, through the genome. And uh, these patterns have uh, certain frequencies in the populations. So we look at location A, we see the pattern in that location, and we know that it has a certain frequency in the population. And then we look at multiple patterns, in, uh, sorry, multiple locations and the patterns that these locations have, and we multiply the frequency of all of these. I think a, a good example would be if, if we take a room with a thousand individuals and we say, okay, how many are wearing jeans? And let's say 50% of the individuals are wearing jeans. How many are wearing, have glasses? And let's say 50% have glasses. But how many have jeans and glasses? So it'll be 25%. And then we continue adding things to 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 where we get to the point that the individual that the the, the overall frequency of the profile is uh, a number that that is orders of magnitude inferior to the population on the planet so you know one in 30 quadrillions and so we can conclude that the two individuals are the same one now uh, these regions don't carry to the best of our knowledge now, don't carry any information. So they, they're not translated into proteins, which ultimately is what makes us what we are. And so uh, there is no useful information in these, in these regions uh, in, in terms of, of the characteristics of the, of the individual. Where um, the research that I and other uh, fellow um, scientists are, are conducting, we're, we're looking at regions that have a direct impact on, uh, on our pigmentation. So we're looking, for example, at genes that regulate the, the amount and the type of melanin that is expressed uh, in, in our body. Uh, we are looking at uh, um, regions that have... Um, for example, one of one of the regions that we're looking at to, to predict uh, um, African descent is something that has been associated to the resistance of a certain type of malaria. So it's very common in in Western Africa, uh, and so having that particular uh, type in that particular region um, is is strongly, very strongly associated to African descent. I see. So, so I, I have a question about that also. Um, for the uh, the method that you're using, can crime labs uh, today do what you're doing in their crime labs with their technology, the existing technology? Yes, that's actually um, the the main focus of my research 
was to be able to develop a method that could be implemented in a crime lab right now. So it, it uses, it, it, it works in a slightly different way, but it uses the same technology that is currently used in crime labs. So the, the DNA sequencer that is currently used can be used for the type of analysis that I do. But Daniele, uh, are you looking at SNP analysis? Yes, yes. I didn't want to use the term not to be too, uh, too specific, but uh, we're basically looking at single uh, base uh, bases in the DNA. So we know that the DNA is composed of principally of, of four molecules, and so we're we're actually looking at specific molecules that determine uh, these um, these physical characteristics of the individuals. I see. So. Uh, Tom, I have a quick comment about about this, but I I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Well, um, I I agree uh, with the idea of looking at um, these traits that will provide additional information, particularly when you're dealing with um, samples from a, from a completely unknown subject. Uh, when the police have nothing but a DNA profile or a DNA sample. Um, where, where do you go from there? And, and this type of work will provide information about where they can go from there. Um, I think what is uh, the concern in the community right now, um, and, and this is always a concern when there's new technology applied, is that uh, when, it, when it comes to genetics, there's nature and there's nurture, you know, genetics, there's phenotype and genotype. So you can have a genotype for a particular hair color or eye color, and those are things that are fairly easily changed with contacts or with hair dye. So uh, I know that um, that's been one of the major concerns with, with implementing technology like this um, in a broad scale, because you might provide a, a, um, a, a phenotype uh, to the police, you might say that this is an individual that has red right. hair and blue eyes and is of Caucasian um, descent, and you have an individual that has spent a lot of time in the sun and dyes their hair or bleaches their hair in most context. But that that concern is, uh, I mean, it's there, but still, in a case where you have no other information, I, I feel like uh, this and, type and, of work would be very useful. Plus, it, it's nothing but an investigative lead. I mean, exactly. it just, you know, exactly. as you mentioned, there's nothing else. You know, they've already uh, checked the uh, CODIS database. There's no hit. All right. So, I mean, where else are they going to go? You know, yes. uh, let's hey, how about, go ahead. Hey, I'm sorry. I just one comment on that. I just want to say it, it. I absolutely agree. There, there needs to be a discussion. Uh, on the significance of, a, of, a, of this type of profile, uh, we need to do uh, a lot of uh, you know groundwork to understand the limitations. So, how many times are you wrong when you make these predictions? But we also have to consider that, in a way, we're doing it already. When a witness tells us that it, it was a, a certain, uh, again, using the same example, uh, a, a blonde uh, guy with blue eyes, maybe he goes and, he, and with a beard, then he goes home, he shaves, and he put a puts a wig on, or again, we know because there's scientific data on this that eyewitness testimony is often wrong. It's just because it's filtered through our perception. So there, so we are in a way we are already doing it, but that doesn't doesn't mean that we don't have to have a discussion on even even the the cop that receives the information. You know, there's a ninety percent chance that this individual is you know. Of Italian descent, I'm, I'm just making a joke because we can't say that. We can say European descent. <laughs> how, how is the how is the the, the police officer going to interpret that? How what weight is he going to give to that 10% of of in, potential incorrectness of the assay? So so even in delivering this information to the investigators, there needs to be some work done. Okay, so I think what we're saying, gentlemen, is hey, we've got a tool here. We got you know that that we can use uh, when we have nothing else, uh, and uh, and it's something that we we need to consider. Now, let's talk about the practicality of it. I mean, we can't even get basic DNA when now all 50 states require that when a person's arrested uh, for a felony that they have to. 
provide their DNA. It takes years sometimes to even get that into CODIS. So what's the practicality of, of police departments around the country utilizing uh, this technique? Uh, Bill, let me ask you first because you you, you've worked with police departments specifically. What do you think? Um, well, I, I agree. There, there is an issue with a backlog of um, database samples from uh, even convicted offenders, not just people that are arrested for felonies, but convicted offenders. And um, as a consequence of that, we routinely see uh, cases where uh, there is a unknown perpetrator case where there is evidence that's been tested and put in the database, and it may go years uh, before there's a hit to CODIS, even though that individual uh, was sampled for CODIS, you know, two, three, four years ago. It is getting better. Uh, I'll just I'll start by saying that. Um, but certainly, if a, a practical set of tests that could provide uh, this type of information that we're discussing. Uh, if there was a practical test that could be applied in your local crime laboratory, it would absolutely have application in uh, a number of, of cases where you had maybe it's a particularly heinous case where there is no uh, no uh, eyewitness testimony, no video uh, evidence, uh, nothing to provide any information about who they should be looking for. So. I, I certainly see that as being the place where you would start applying this uh, type of technology. Um, and in fact, that's exactly how they started applying DNA testing at the outset, is on those particularly heinous cases where there was no other, no other evidence that could link somebody, they would then send it to DNA. Um, so I, I think there is an application. I do think that, uh, um, you know, there are backlogs in all laboratories. The more DNA testing that's done, the more types of testing that's available, the more backlogs you generate. But that doesn't mean that you don't look forward and, and try and apply new technologies like this. If you can. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Padini, uh, if a law enforcement agency somewhere uh, you know, in, the, in the country had a case where they thought this would be helpful in, in some of the work you're doing, could they, I mean, could they send samples to you uh, as part of your research, or uh, is that are you working with any law enforcement agencies to actually analyze uh, evidence that are from a crime scene? I am not right now, uh, and uh, a lot of well, I think every state requires that uh, the laboratory that does the analysis for them is is accredited and uh, has. Uh, Conducting some proficiency testing, and and, and uh, so I, I don't think that uh, I even could do it, uh, or that okay. Although the data uh, could not would would not be used to convict an individual, but I, I think it w it would pose a challenge if it, the data would be used, for example, to you know grant uh, a warrant for you know um, entering a house. I mean that that might be challenged. I think. Okay, I just want to know how realistic, because again, the general public is watching the show here, and they're saying, "Hey, they got this new, uh, new information they can get from DNA." Uh, I don't want to give them the wrong impression that, "Hey, everybody's doing this." So, uh, uh, Dr. Watson, you mentioned a particular case. So, how prevalent is this around the country? Um, is this onesies and twosies, or what? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say it's, it's likely. Um, if anyone is doing this type of testing for forensic casework, it is one-off cases. That's that's going to be it. There's the laboratory that um, uh, was it was in Florida uh, that that uh, tested the DNA in a case that I referred to. Um, they'd gone out of business, and uh, they did SNP testing also. They had a panel that. Uh, a, a group of genetic markers they could test that would provide information about um, the, the likely um, regional background, exactly what we're talking about here. And um, it, they were not successful with it. Uh, it could be because they were too early in the process. It could be because uh, their tests were not uh, sufficiently well-developed. 
Um, but I'm, I'm glad that there are others that are proceeding forward with this, this sort of research. I, I feel like it will be implemented at some point uh, when you look at all the other technologies we've had that started out exactly like this. They okay. eventually been adopted. You look at mitochondrial sequencing. At one time, that was only sequencing was only done for research. YSCR analysis. There are now X, um, the X SCR X chromosome SCR analysis. Um, they've expanded the panel of genetic markers that are tested uh, from autosomal uh, genetic markers. So um, it's it's just a matter of time uh, before this type of testing is also brought into forensic labs. Okay. Uh, normally, when we when we we approach a, a topic or a subject uh, at the beginning of the show, we start from the beginning and work up. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to get right to Dr. Bedini's uh, research, which is the newest kind of thing. Um, and and I appreciate uh, he, uh, from hearing from Dr. Bedini and Dr. Watson. Let's step back a little bit and look at the basic DNA uh, processing that is, is going on. There's a lot of misconceptions out there uh, by the general public, by law enforcement themselves. Um, they think DNA testing takes weeks and months, and um, how long? Um, how long does it really take when a specimen from a crime scene is sent to a lab? How long does it take before they can? Uh, again, they're looking for a suspect, so it, this is not just somebody's been arrested. Let's enter it into CODIS, but um, you know, we uh, we've got. We've got evidence at a crime scene. We want to know if, if we, uh, we don't know who it is. We, we want to see if he's in CODIS. How quickly does that process uh, happen? Either one of you can jump in. Um, go, go ahead, Danielle. I think I, I would start by saying that it really depends on the type of evidence. So let's say if it's... Um, if it's a blood stain on a swab, it, technically it it could take a short amount of time. You could you could obtain a profile uh, within five six hours. Uh, if it's a buccal swab, now there are there are new machines that are coming out that are in, kind of automate the full process. So you can actually put the swab in the machine, and about an hour later. A little over an hour get uh, get a DNA profile. They're they're still being developed because they don't work 100% of the time. But it's it's a pretty fast process. If it's a, an an old bone sample from uh, decomposed human remains, that may take te again. I'm talking technically uh, several days. But the the issue is really the. the the kind of overhead of, of the the process so the the evidence has to be accepted it has to be brought into the chain of custody it has to be uh, eva initially evaluated by uh, a serologist to determine what type of body fluid we're dealing with then an extraction has to be made then a quantitation then an amplification and all these steps are have to kind of um, find their place within the overall laboratory process. So it may take a lot of time. Then everything has to be reviewed by um, a peer and eventually by a supervisor. So the, the process has, has a lot of overhead. And, um, but Bill, probably you can you can talk about that even more. Well, even... No, I, I, I think you've hit, hit the nail on the head. The, uh... The issue is not really how long it takes to do the testing because, as, as Daniele has pointed out, um, the, the testing can be done very rapidly um, in its application in the laboratory. Um, you, you do deal with um, labs that have backlogs. So a sample comes in, it's, it's not necessarily going to be tested or even looked at when it immediately comes in. Um, the the hope is that eventually automation will help um, uh, reduce the amount of time it takes to get uh, samples or evidence from um, your your storage locker into your your testing stream more rapidly. Uh, and in fact, we're seeing that. I mean, when we initially started testing DNA, it did take weeks and weeks and months. Uh, when, when I first started uh, doing um, DNA analysis and forensics, 
uh, it was routine. Uh, we were using radioactive uh, pro labeled probes, DNA probes that would bind to the DNA. And uh, it was not uncommon to have uh, a case take five, six months. Um, when PCR analysis came onto the scene, we started to see that uh, redu reduced dramatically uh, into maybe a month. Um, as our processes became more refined, our, our understanding of the testing, uh, as well as the, the actual tests themselves, as, as those all improved, the, the turnaround time for testing has decreased. But you still have to deal with those samples coming in the door. So unless you're willing to put everything down and start this one sample when it comes in, it's going to take some time to get it tested. What? What about what about the quantity of the of the sample at, from the crime scene or the evidence? Is there a minimum quantity that's necessary to to get a profile? Or you know, we, I've heard anything from a, a pinhead's worth to a lot more. What what is the quantity required? So for the police officers, especially in the smaller police departments, who who not only collect evidence but they investigate the case and 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 make arrests you know it's a one person operation sometimes how small can the sample be uh, for uh, the DNA process to uh, be effective well that, I think that varies based on the sample um, because if you're dealing with a seminal fluid stain you're gonna have a lot more DNA in it uh, in a in a pinhead size stain than you would in a pinhead size stain of blood um, but uh, again, getting back to maybe the history of forensic science, when we first started, you wanted to have a microgram of DNA in order to do the analysis. Um, and that's one one thousandth of a gram. Uh, and then now we're into the picogram range, uh, which is, uh, help me, Daniele, what are we looking at? Uh, Picogram uh, one to the, 12, to the minus twelve. So thank you. Uh, a thousand billions, right? <laughs> yeah. so, sounds right. So the the point is, you have in one cell in your body, you have between about three and a half and uh, eight or so picograms of DNA, depending on the type of cell. Um, now uh, there are labs that test routinely fifty picograms of DNA and uh, are able to generate at least a partial profile. So uh, you're looking at uh, something on the order of five or six cells, maybe up to, uh, uh, maybe up to ten, 10 or 12. But that's not routine. They're, they're, those labs generally are the exception. And there are a lot of issues associated with testing samples that are that small. But the point is, is that I, I can't tell you only collect stains that are of a certain size because we're to the point where the, the stain that we can test is actually smaller than we can see. So, at least in some instances. So, probably better to collect everything and let it be sorted out by the forensic science. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, and that's something we always say. Um, well, it's 7.39. What I'd like to do is just take a, a quick break and have uh, Alex uh, present our... Uh, she just has one um, one article that uh, she's put up on the blog, uh, and then when, when we come back, I'd like to talk about s statistical analysis. DNA is the only evidence that's done it right. In reference to when they when you present DNA in a courtroom, you not only say that it's a match, you give the uh, mathematical probability of it not being a match. Uh, and I'd like to know how DNA the DNA community came. To, to do that, seeing you're the newest forensic scientist, science, yet fingerprints, we got billions and billions of fingerprints in databases, yet they, they have not done the same thing. So I want to talk about that. And then what's most important uh, before the time ends, uh, both, uh, both of you, uh, why did you get into this business? What got you there? Uh, what recommendations would you give students in rep that might be interested in uh, in studying DNA or being a, a, a professional either in research or a practitioner in, in the laboratory. They really need to hear from you in your own life experiences and, um, 
on what they need to do and give them some direction. Is that fair enough, gentlemen? Absolutely. Very good. Alex, Alex Metzl, uh, uh, Forensic IQ update report. Uh, um, she, uh, she had a couple that related to forensics, and I told her we're going to hold off on those because we're going to add a few things, especially with Dr. Uh, Padini's uh, research that we want to add to it. But what is that one, case, uh, one uh, uh, article that you had in there, Alex? Thanks, Tom. Um, so the article that I looked at this week that we're presenting was on lifting fingerprints from receipt, which in the past uh, investigators have not been able to do because a lot of places that have receipts use thermal receipt paper, and the common chemicals used to lift prints actually turned that paper black so they couldn't lift the prints. But now they've developed a new technique using heat and blue light, and they're able to pick up the sweat from a from the fingertip and able to get a print off of that. I, I can't believe it took all this time to figure that out. I mean, uh, that kind of paper has been out there for a long time. So when, uh, when you say blue, uh, there's no chemical uh, treatment, just a blue light lets you see it? That's, that's what it said, yeah, just blue light treatment. Interesting, interesting. I, I was surprised because I thought that we could get fingerprints from pretty much everything. That's what we learned in your class. So I was like, this is interesting. That's why I checked out the article. Mm -hmm. Very good. Alex, uh, you're a junior. You're going to be going into your senior year. Is that correct? Going into my senior year next year, yep. Okay, very good. Al Alex has been working with me, and she was uh, responsible for helping develop a uh, – uh, one of our crime scene settings that uh, students are going to be working on, and uh, appreciate that. And uh, she's from uh, the Maryland area. So thank you very much for uh, your work with uh, ForensicWeek.com um, this, uh, this semester, and certainly uh, um, the crime scenes that uh, are going to make a big difference next semester uh, when we have our students go through it. So thank you, hon. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. It was awesome. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. And again, like always, if you have any questions when we continue, please uh, don't be afraid to do that. Okay, gentlemen, math, uh, statistical analysis. Tell us, what is it that DNA did to 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 make uh, DNA is a valid, reliable, acceptable scientific evidence in the courtrooms? Uh, very clear. Uh, can't be argued very well. The only thing that you, they can argue is that the quality of the product uh, may be lacking, uh, you know, etc. But the process um, has been strong. Tell us what was done and what can we tell the rest of forensic science who's having a problem, like fingerprints, uh, firearms, tool marks, those things. What do they need to do to bring us where we are with uh, DNA? Let's start with uh, Dr. Padini, and then um, especially, especially, you know, you, uh, coming from Italy, and I don't know how different it is there. I know it, it, it certainly looks different, uh, but the food's um, better. Uh, yeah, the food's better. Well, no, the food is just as good in my mother's house, thank you, <laughs> and my wife, my wife also. Um, so, uh, um, but tell us uh, what was done uh, to make. DNA so strong in the courtroom because it doesn't matter how strong you think it is it's what the 12 jurors think it is in the courtroom that matters well uh, I, I think it's um, it's um, a lot easier to develop um, um, interpretational models for DNA evidence than it is for other disciplines because of um, the, because we, we are looking at, as I go back to the previous example, we're looking at the, these locations spread throughout the genome and the patterns that these locations have. And it's, it's relatively simple to uh, generate statistics, so uh, uh, to determine the frequency of these patterns in the various populations. Uh, going back to the example of, of looking, you know, at the, the way... Um, looking at a room full of, uh, full of individuals. And it's, uh, let's say that the location that we're looking at is the type of pants that they're wearing. There's only a certain amount of, of pants. There's uh, jeans, khaki, and, you know, I don't know, uh, 
skirts. Uh, and each one of these has a certain frequency in, in, each, in each population. So it's relatively simple. Fingerprint patterns are, are a lot more di diverse. There's a lot more variability. So that represents a much, much bigger challenge. Um, another factor that I think uh, DNA, DNA analysis has, has an advantage is, or had an advantage in, in developing uh, sound uh, interpretational models is the fact that it, it comes from the diagnostic world. So the laboratories uh, were, biological laboratories were already uh, used to being accredited, used to being, uh, used to follow certain guidelines, doing proficiency testing, so it, it was easy to, to implement them into the forensic world. Um, so, uh, so this is, this is, yeah, my take on this. What do you say, Bill? Well, I think uh, I think those are are very valid points. I think the, uh, the the sort of clinical background that the science started in and uh, its eventual application in forensics did did lend a lot, uh, specifically towards uh, uh, the standards that we have set for ourselves. Um, Tom, you talk about how we did it right and how um, you know DNA is accepted. Um, I would argue that a lot of the issues that we run into uh, in our, our field in DNA analysis are of our own making. We sometimes make our requirements for accreditation or, or requirements for validation and implementation. We set that bar so high that it's very difficult for laboratories to, to, uh, to meet it. Um, and so that means that there's a lot fewer laboratories that do it. I mean, you can look at almost any small or, or mid-sized or large laboratory and you'll see a, a large number of people trained to do fingerprints uh, because the technology is um, well understood and it's it's diverse and everybody knows it and and they don't they don't set as high uh, a bar towards the application of that technology as we do in forensics. Well, uh, I, I have I, a question. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for our guests. Um, so for fingerprints, uh, we all know about the uh, infamous Mayfield case where uh, it, was, uh, it, right. was, it was incorrect. So have there been any of those cases with uh, DNA, to your knowledge? Um, I, I can speak to that. and um, I actually have a fingerprint background also. I worked in the Fort Worth Police Department laboratory. While I worked there, I was trained to do fingerprints also. Um, the, the Mayfield case relates to a, um, an incorrect uh, match uh, that was made uh, that implicated, I believe it was an attorney out of Seattle. Isn't uh, that where you... Yeah, well, I, not uh, Oregon. Or oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in the uh, in the bombing that occurred in in uh, London, Mid and no, Madrid. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I lecture I, on this. That's why I know Bill. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, you know there were analysts that said that these are not a match. Um, and um, I, certainly with fingerprints, uh, the argument has been made that a more rigorous statistical uh, analysis of the of the comparisons that are made would would make a comparison more objective. Um, the the question you had asked about whether there were similar circumstances in DNA, uh, I've dealt with cases where there have been, uh, and there's a really good case out of the UK uh, where a gentleman matched at uh, six STR markers that were tested and. And they they went and they arrested him in a sexual assault case, I believe. And um, they arrested this gentleman. He was wheelchair bound, and he was lived 200 miles away from where the crime occurred. And he said it wasn't me, it couldn't be me. And they arrested him and they put him in jail. Eventually, they did additional testing and found that at the additional markers, he didn't match. So um, what you see from that is that more genetic markers gives a, a um, a, a better comparison, at least in that case. So there are, are cases where you've seen similar things happen. Right. Um, I, I want to jump into interpretation of mixed DNA profiles. Does that mean when you have 
you know, two different biological fluids that have been mixed. Is that what you mean by that? Uh, it certainly can't. I'm sorry. You know, Daniele, I please go ahead. Uh, I'll just answer that question. Well, it it doesn't necessarily mean that there are two different biological fluids. It's uh, simply uh, that um, the contributors to uh, there are multiple contributors to a, a DNA profile, and uh, just to kind of connect to what we were saying before, uh, these these methods are becoming uh, so sensitive that we're able to pick up uh, background DNA that may not may may have been there before the the perpetrator actually deposited their DNA. So now you hear a lot about touch DNA. Um, Looking at uh, you know handguns or steering wheels or or objects that were touched by by the perpetrator and you, when you, you know, these are objects that have been touched by other people so it's it's likely that there's um, a DNA from multiple contributors and so uh, it's it's very important to develop uh, interpretational guidelines to um, be able to make uh, sound decisions off of these mixed profiles that are a lot more complex than the conventional single source uh, profile. But generally, uh, do, uh, do both of you feel that gen generally you can make a distinction in your interpretation? In, in a mixed profile? Yes. Uh, well, it would depend on the profile. Um, there are certainly DNA profiles that um, are interpreted and should be interpreted as inconclusive. Um, okay. But but there are absolutely cases where mixed profiles can be um, can be uh, attributed to the uh, individuals that can, that contributed to them. Okay, I'd like to spend the last eight minutes talking about the career and what got you guys uh, to where you are today, um, uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, Padini, why don't you start uh, and you know tell us uh, what you know? Why did you major in uh, molecular biology in college, and how did you get into the uh, move into the forensic community? Because again, in in the interest of 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 students who are thinking about the same thing now. Uh, well, I was you know, always fascinated by biology, so I decided to, to study that. Uh, and the way the universities are structured in Italy is slightly different. You have to make a decision um, right after high school on, on where you're going to go. And the, the, the career in the university is, is kind of already decided. So I, I signed up for biology, and after a while, molecular biology was where I saw the light. And I was working in, in an environmental genetics laboratory. I was trying to develop a tobacco plant that would start to glow in presence of heavy metals. It didn't work, <laughs> but, uh, but it was a good idea. And um, what year is that? What year was this? Nineteen ninety-three, ninety-four. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, forensic DNA was up and running. Yes, it, it had uh, it's starting to become popular, and I had to do a military service at the time in Italy. It was mandatory, so I decided to combine my my passions for molecular biology with the service to my country, and I was able to enter the Carabinieri, which is a, a military institution but with law enforcement duties on on the Italian territory. And uh, given my my molecular biology background, I was then put in the in the crime lab and kind of the rest is history. I think uh, I, I decided to stay in this because well, it's, it's a fascinating discipline and I think that for a scientist um, it is rare to see their work have an immediate impact on society, particularly for a DNA analyst. Uh, their work, uh, you know, a, a profile that they're able to generate off of evidence at a crime scene the next day may you know take somebody off the streets that could hurt somebody else or or free an innocent individual uh, or you know it's it's just as important so i think that's what what inspired me and and also i've always liked research so right now i kind of have the best of both worlds i i educate people that are eventually going to have this the, the opportunity to have this impact on society while i'm doing research that maybe may be useful in, in hopefully the near future in, in for the same cause. So uh, for students who uh, who may have the same interests as you here in America, um, 
can I assume that the, they really need to g get their master's degree? Uh, I mean, the people doing the hiring now, it, it appears that it is that what you're seeing? Yes, there's a there's a lot of competition, and so the higher your level of education, uh, the better the better it is. So I think that uh, not only a master in forensic science, but specifically in in molecular forensic molecular biology, is really an advantage. Uh, I would say almost a necessity right now to to be employed or to be hired as a as a DNA analyst. And I and I would add to that: try to get internship experience while you're getting your education because uh, your education is, is important but a crime lab director that is hiring is going to look at your experience as well. Absolutely and not only, not only that you got the experience but while you're getting that experience you, you are demonstrating to people in the field that you have those capabilities and I, I've seen a lot of my students who went out and did internships and then, and then eventually got hired by those those same uh, same organizations. We, you know, we're, we're very fortunate. GW, Stevenson University. We're right outside Washington D.C., where our major fel, uh, federal agencies are, and so we have a lot of great internships for our students. And that's the benefit of being around here. Thank you, thank you, uh, Bill. How about you? Tell us a little bit about uh, how you got to where you are. Well, uh, I can't sing. So I went into forensics. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, I, I, I actually agree that this is a field where you get a feedback in biology much more quickly than you do um, in other uh, fields in biology. I started in research in 1990, and by 1994, I was tired of research. And so I, I started to work at the medical examiner's office in, in Dallas because here is an opportunity to do DNA analysis, help them develop the technology to do DNA analysis, apply that, and, and get immediate feedback uh, as opposed to the research I had been doing. So I, I absolutely agree with that. It's a fascinating field that, that uh, unlike other biology fields, provides so much, um, so much immediate feedback. As far as the sort of background that you want to have, um, I, I agree. More education is better. Uh, it is possible to get into the field um, with a bachelor's degree, um, but you have to have very specific courses. So, uh, if you're looking at biology or looking at DNA analysis, so I would recommend um, you know talking to people that are in the field that can give you that kind of guidance uh, before you start taking classes. Let, let me ask you. Um, I want to tell the vi uh, viewers that you're you're coming to us from Texas. So, are you saying that in Texas um, they are people with bachelor's degrees in the right coursework are getting jobs in labs? Well, yes, absolutely. And I I would say it's not just Texas, but um, understand that there's a limitation uh, your your ability to uh, advance in the field. Uh, is going to be limited if you have a bachelor's degree. So a higher education certainly does um, provide more opportunities for advancement in the future. And we do see more and more laboratories that are saying we only want to hire masters or only want to hire PhD students. Derek, Derek and Laura, um, Laura both are graduate students. Laura at GW and Derek uh, um, uh, at uh, Stevenson University. Um, what has been your experience, uh, the two of you, in reference to uh, looking at the job market? Are, are you seeing uh, the the requirement for a master's degree around the Washington area, or are you uh, are are there possibilities for uh, bachelor's degrees? What are you seeing? Well, I think uh, mainly when I when I take a look at the job opportunities out there, I feel like uh, a lot of it they focus more on the actual experience that you have um, rather than uh, degrees. I mean, some of them. Uh, have they they say like master's degree preferred, but I think it's mostly mostly like three years of experience in like a, a laboratory setting, things like that. So I think it's the experience that really counts. But of course, of course, students always say, "How can I get the experience if you don't?" Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You so right so master's courses, um, uh, I think I think that could uh, that could give some of that experience, especially uh, like in hand, hand in hand with like. Internships, like for for instance, I was at the Maryland State Police, um, and I've been with their quality assurance unit, and now I'm with their biology unit. So 
I've ha I have experience in the laboratory, so I think that could go uh, a long way towards um, uh, finding a job like that. Yeah, great. Laura, how about you? Yeah, it's the same thing, just they mainly want experience. Um, you know, some places will look for a master's degree or something, but I also, like, found this when I was looking for jobs with my bachelor's degree, which is in graphic design, and they always wanted the experience, too, and I'm like, well, how am I supposed to get experience if you don't hire me? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, I find it, I, I'm finding it a lot easier to look at and apply for jobs um, with the crime scene investigation than with my bachelor's degree in graphic design, actually. Very good. Yeah, I had a, a, a TA uh, several uh, years ago who was a criminal justice major and biology major, and he did an internship with Homeland Security's uh, Crime Lab, and he spent time in different uh, areas, and he ended up sitting in the, the question document laboratory, and it was something he never thought he was going to like, but he loved it. Uh, the day he graduated, uh, Homeland Security offered him a job, and he is a He's gone through his three-year uh, internship now. He's a full-fledged uh, question document examiner for him, and uh, and he, you know, he certainly. And I bumped into him at a Maryland football game a few weeks ago, and he said that uh, the internship was made the difference in his career. So, uh, to all all of you out there listening, uh, I think the key word there is experience and internships can make a difference. So, uh, uh, do that. I see that we're actually two minutes over, so. Um, before I, I, I uh, say goodbye to our guests and, and thank them, let me just say that uh, uh, next two weeks, um, December 26th, Thursday, and then January 2nd, uh, Thursday, uh, because of the Christmas and New Year holidays, um, uh, we will not be doing uh, any shows. Uh, everybody's going to be enjoying the holidays. I'm going to be up uh, uh, seeing my family up in New England, uh, and I look forward to that. So our next show will be uh, January 9th. Uh, 2014, where we have NCIS agent Elizabeth uh, Toomer, uh, who will be discussing blood spatter in crime scene reconstruction. I'm looking forward to uh, I, um, hearing from her. I've I've had to I had to comment for uh, on blood spatter uh, on a number of cases uh, with with not that much experience, so I'm looking forward to getting some from her. Uh, January uh, 16th, the next uh, week, uh, we have Sandy Enslow, who's a forensic artist and graphic arts uh, coordinator, so Laura, you'll be interested, mm -hmm. from Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. I met her uh, when I was working on the uh, American Academy of Forensic Science webinar a few weeks ago. She provided me some data. I asked her if she'd be interested in being on the show. She's really excited about doing that. She got her approval from her uh, leadership, so that'll be January uh, 16th. Uh, the following uh, week, January 23rd, we're trying to get Dr. Barry Logan, who's the president of the American Academy of Forensic Science. He uh, he has agreed to be on the show, and we're trying to work his schedule. So we'll um, we'll let you know next uh, next time we're together on January 9th when Dr. Logan will be coming. There's one other uh, show that we have scheduled February 20th. February 20th, I'm very excited to say that we will be doing a live show at the American Academy of Forensic Science annual uh, scientific meeting in Seattle, Washington. Uh, on Thursday evening, uh, during the exhibition of all the uh, forensic science vendors, they have a what they call a university fair where all the forensic universities uh, that have forensic programs um, um, have, have their tables and in, uh, and they talk to potential students trying to get into forensics programs. So what we're going to do is we're going to be live that night in that area. Searchy Laboratories, uh, the vendor, will be sponsoring our show and is providing us uh, with the ability to do that with uh, internet connections, etc. So on February 20th, uh, you could hear directly from these universities from all over the country and out of the country because remember, American Academy of Forensic Science is an international organization. So. Uh, let me just say uh, thanks very much to Drs. Uh, Watson and Pudini. Uh, you were great. I, I thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Pudini, my, I'd like to say bon Natale. Um, <laughs> and and uh, for the rest of you, happy holidays to you, uh, safe travel, and may your wishes for, all, uh, for the holidays be fulfilled. We'll see you next time in 2014 on January 9th. Remember, ForensicWeek.com is being brought to you through the cooperation with 
with Hangout10.com live TV show network. We recommend that you go to the Hangout10.com website and see uh, the schedule of other shows like this one available uh, to you to learn and be entertained. Meanwhile, tell all your friends and, uh, and colleagues to tune in and keep watching ForensicWeek.com. We hope the content presented in this show, as well as previous ForensicWeek.com shows uh, archives, uh, have opened up your mind and curiosity to the wonders of forensic and criminal justice science. Ladies and gentlemen, see you next time in 2014, and thank you for watching. See you later.